There is no practical obstacle whatever now to the creation of an efficient index to all human knowledge, ideas and achievements. To the creation, that is, of a complete planetary memory for all mankind. He was one of the early inventors of, of science fiction. The idea of time travel, the possibility of invisibility, <laughs> of intergalactic struggles. And then he came up with ideas of how we might reorganize the knowledge apparatus of the world, which he called the world brain. For Wells, the world brain had to contain all that was learnt and known, and that was being learnt and known. They were frank in their ambition and dazzling in their ability to execute it. The Google Book Scanning Project is clearly the most ambitious world brain scheme that has ever been invented. Il y aurait un grand danger à ce que Google est le monopole de cette ambition. The nightmare scenario in 20 years time would be Google tracking everything we read. Google could basically hold the whole world hostage. This is no remote dream, no fantasy. It is a plain statement of a contemporary state of affairs. It's a library, a public library, where people go to look at books and read them and take them away. That girl works at the library and she checks on books that are going out and books that are coming back in. I love libraries. I like the smell, uh, the smell of paper properly preserved. It's as if it's the smell of a hay barn that's been uh, cleared of all its animals and made into human intelligence. And in a library, you, you really, even if you're sitting in the tea room discussing your latest findings, it's amazing how much social interaction with other people will actually help you to enrich what you're doing. In this part of the library, the grown-ups can read the stories to the children. People sometimes say to me, aren't libraries obsolete? Um, it's, it's absurd. They are nerve centers, centers of intellectual energy. The first appeal of Google's uh, enterprise when we saw it was just digitizing millions and millions of books. At Harvard, we have by far the greatest university library in the world. It's enormous, 17 million volumes. And every library wants its holdings digitized for lots of reasons, including preservation. But beyond that, the, it raises the possibility of sharing your intellectual wealth. So here comes Google. They've got the energy, they've got the technology, they've got the money, and they said, we'll do it for you, free. About 10 years ago, I got a visit from the vice president of Google. And she walked into my office and described a project that Google had in mind which was to digitize all the books in the Harvard Library. My first thought was, to put it bluntly, that maybe they were smoking something because I didn't think it was possible. When you actually negotiate with Google um, and do so on their turf, you enter a strange world. Uh, a Google office doesn't have chairs like this chair. Uh, the furniture consists of large inflated balls that are colored green or red or yellow. And the young Google engineers are sitting on these. It's a kind of never, never land feeling.
Google is a company that believes in its fundamental mission of empowering everyone in this world with all the information they need. From a farmer in Africa, to a mother in India, to a business person in Japan, everyone needs information in this modern day and age. And Google believes in breaking all the barrier between every individual and the information they seek. One of the things that you need to understand about Google is that they try to uh, roll out projects first and then to think about the consequences later. So you would often see them experiment with something that looks very cool. Uh, it may be the Google Street View project. Google launched Street View in 2007, part of the search engine's long-term goal to create a virtual 3D map of the whole planet, right down to street level. But investigations have revealed that Google's Street View cars were collecting more than just photographs for their data banks. Their antennas were also hoovering up personal information from unencrypted Wi-Fi networks, including internet history and passwords. I think the case of Google collecting Wi-Fi information, it reveals a complete lack of respect for privacy within the corporation. Such projects often reveal that Google does not fully understand the social consequences of its own work. Google did such a fabulous job in creating a vision, not only that a universal digital library could be created, but that it could be done today. The Google engineers are like good engineers everywhere. They just like to think about how do we surmount these challenges. They sort of leave the lawsuit to the, uh, to the lawyers to worry about. Internet hace pocos años era un medio muy joven. Lo único que se podía encontrar en Internet es aquello creado y producido especialmente para Internet. Sin embargo, todo lo que todo el acervo cultural, todo el conocimiento, todo el saber que el ser humano ha desarrollado a lo largo de, de la historia está en los libros. Claro, si los libros no estaban en Internet, las posibilidades de Internet como un medio de acceso a información, a conocimiento, eran limitadas. I went to Google in January 2003. I actually made what now I, I feel quite embarrassed about. Um, I made a presentation to them telling them what they ought to be doing, only to find out a few months later that they'd actually been doing it for a while already. Project Ocean was the kind of code name, development code name that Google were giving to what eventually became Google Books. So it was called Project Ocean because it was big, I imagine. <laughs> Google seemed to think that they could do almost a million in three years. La biblioteca de Montserrat eh, té els seus inicis al segle XI, bàsicament quan ja venir, van venir els primers monjos eh, eh, i van necessitar de seguida tenir doncs, uns llibres per la pregària, uns llibres per la lectura espiritual. Aquest és un dels llibres que s'ha digitalitzat en el projecte de Google, l'exercitatori espiritual de el pare García de Cisneros, abat d'aquest monestir en el segle XVI, i va preparar uns exercicis en els quals doncs, és tot un itinerari per entrar a, en la vida cristiana en profunditat. A través d'internet hi ha la possibilitat de, de buscar contínuament una cosa darrere de l'altra sense un aprofundiment en cada una de les coses que un consulta. En aquest cas, aquest llibre seria com una crida d'atenció per no passar doncs, a un curs o un córrer d'una pàgina a una altra sense un aprofundiment personal espiritual. Doncs, eh, hem, hem pogut digitalitzar en aquest projecte Google uns 23.400 o, o coses així de llibres. 
ens va semblar que era una facilitat la difusió de la cultura. Google no va pagar res per digitalitzar els llibres. Ho trobeu just? Vull dir, què passa si algun dia algú fa negoci o es beneficia d'això? Una pregunta massa difícil, potser o no? Potser sí, és que no tinc elements per per entrar en l'altre tema que el que comporta la digitalització i la facilitat que aquests llibres siguin consultats des de lluny estant. Google were and are free to do what they want with the scans. And why should that concern us? I mean, part of our ethos and part of our objective as a library is to make the information that's contained in our library available as free of charge as we can possibly make it to anybody who needs it. And if Google is going to do that on a larger scale, that's fine. If they are going to make money out of it down the line, why not? You know, they've invested a lot of money in it. Um, there's no such thing as a free lunch. When automobiles came along first, they seemed likely to become a rich man's monopoly. They cost upward of a thousand pounds. Henry Ford ordered their that. He put the boy man on the road. We want a Henry Ford today to modernize the distribution of knowledge, make good knowledge cheap and easy in this still very ignorant, ill-educated, ill-served, English-speaking world of ours which might be the greatest power on earth for the good of mankind. We started the Internet Archive in 1996. The idea was to have all the published works of humankind available to everybody, that this was the opportunity of our generation that you know, like the previous generation had put a man on the moon. The Internet Archive had been completely open with Google. In fact, I'd gone and given a speech that was attended by, I think, all of the senior executives on how one could go about building a digital library of all books, music, video. And I had hoped that there was going to be a way to work with them, and, but that was not to be. Libraries had signed secret agreements with Google. We, we didn't know what was really going on. When they started coming out as a completely separate project and not working with others, then I started to become uh, suspicious. I would say that this mass digitization is something like running a huge machine through a library. You take books by the shelf, they're, they're put in cartons on carts, they're loaded onto trucks, um, and then Google at this time had three places in the country where it was doing digitization. Uh, supposedly, it didn't give the address of where they were. Google won't say how much scanning all the books cost, but there are estimates that oh, it's somewhere between thirty and a hundred dollars per book. So if you multiply that times twenty million, Google early on bent over backwards to keep us from communicating with the other libraries. There were three or four large ones, and each of us was told we should not tell the others what kind of a contract we had and how we were working with Google. We actually do more search queries in China alone than any other search company does in any other single national market, by which I really mean Google in, in the United States. So we certainly do aspire to be a world brand. I think H.G. Wells was, I mean, he's well known for having been quite prescient about a lot of the things that he envisioned. 
sure we don't have a time machine yet, but um, pretty much the rest of it was dead on. We have a product which is a very, very popular product. It's called Baidu Wenku. Uh, the Chinese name of it is the Baidu Library. Um, it allows people to upload uh, materials that they have that are either you know, of their own creation or that they have the intellectual property rights to, to our site.我们都是给那个北京各大高校因为扫描完了能存储数据,存储更多的数据就是相当于一种资源。Some of the enthusiasts for Google's way of gathering data, and it's not just Google at all, I mean, it's Silicon Valley in general, it's the, the current cultural moment. It includes the other Silicon Valley companies, but also the modern world of finance, and also the modern world of spycraft for states and also the modern world of criminality and the modern world of insurance and healthcare. Um, all these things have this idea that you grab all this data in order to become very powerful. You create a differential in your ability to see information versus the ordinary person and you create these new incredible castles of power. But it's okay, it's not just traditional power mongering because you're making the world more efficient. Shortly after the launch of Google Books in different events, I ran into Larry Page and Sergey Brin and, and had this brief exchange with them about the potential. And, you know, there was a characteristic Google founder response, which was a kind of glint in their eyes and a smile, and the sense that this was just the beginning of something much bigger than you, even you at this point can, can imagine. It's all human knowledge, in books and out of books, woven together into a single entity that's accessible by anybody, anywhere in the world, anytime. And that all knowledge is transformative. It just really kicks up the civilization in our society into another level. I was a little boy in the 70s growing up in India watching reruns of Star Trek on our family's black and white TV. And from that, those times, the picture of a Star Trek computer was deeply ingrained in my head. As a little boy, I was just fascinated by the fact that you can walk up to a computer and ask it, computer, what's the atmosphere of that planet? That was just the most fascinating thing to a little boy. And from that day on, it was my dream to build that Star Trek computer. Only later would I grow up and realize it's really hard because computers don't understand language. And I went through this brief period of disbelief as a graduate student uh, where I didn't think I would reach my dream in my lifetime. But thanks to Google and all the technologies that we have built here and what I see in the pipeline, I'm closer to my dream than ever. If you're in Silicon Valley, you have this idea that you're paving the way for the emergence of the great artificial intelligence, that we're building this new life form that's gonna take over the world and Google is providing the memories for its brain. J'ai eu l'occasion de connaître un ou deux représentants de Google. Euh, ils sont même venus me voir. J'ai trouvé des, des jeunes gens très, très propres sur eux. Très, visiblement, ils avaient abandonné leurs jeans pour mettre des cravates parce qu'ils pensaient qu'en Europe, c'était mieux. Et, et ils avaient une espèce de, de mélange d'arrogance et d'esprit commercial brutal. Euh, Figurez-vous qu'ils ont tellement mal compris notre psychologie qu'ils m'ont apporté un petit cadeau. C'était, je me rappelle, une espèce de petite théière qui permettait d'avoir du thé chaud quand vous vous promeniez en train. J'ai regardé ces jeunes gens, j'ai laissé tomber le, 
le, le, le cadeau. Et, je, et tout à coup, j'ai vu dans le regard qu'il s'était, en bons commerciaux, rendu compte qu'il s'était trompé sur la nature de la cible commerciale que j'étais. C'était assez bizarre comme conception qu'il pouvait avoir du président de la Bibliothèque nationale de France. Le défi posé par euh, l'annonce tenitruante de Google, son intention de faire une bibliothèque universelle et de la faire seule, en fait, était, ce défi était si clair que la réponse euh, s'est imposée très vite avec autant de clarté. Et surtout, euh, nous avons constaté très vite que Google, fort de sa puissance et peut-être de son arrogance, se permettait de numériser des livres sans l'autorisation des auteurs et des éditeurs, pour en donner des petits morceaux sur la toile, sans autorisation. Et à nos yeux, c'était insupportable. Je ne pense pas que Google est conscient du fait que c'est une corporation. Je pense que Google ne pense pas de se comme une NGO qui fait juste de faire beaucoup de money. Ils pensent de se comme des réformateurs réformateurs qui ont juste de avoir leur stock traded on stock exchanges and who just happen to have investors and shareholders, but they do think of themselves as ultimately being in the business of making the world better. At Harvard, we only permitted Google to digitize books in the public domain, but the other research libraries that Google first went to, permitted Google to digitize books covered by copyright, as soon as you get into the copyright area, things get rapidly complicated. We're allowing Google to scan all of our books, those in the public domain and those still in copyright. I, we believe it is legal, ethical, and a noble endeavor that will transform our society. Legal because we believe copyright law allows us fair use of the millions of books that are being digitized. Fair use is a piece of American copyright law that allows uh, us to make copies without every, asking any permission, without paying any fee, for certain carved out uses. I happen to think Google's fair use defense is strong. One of the things that courts have done over the last decade or so is decided that search engines who routinely make copies of information are making fair uses when they do it in order to help people find information that they're looking for. First, we learned that Google was scanning books. And I remember loving that idea because I'm a reader and I write nonfiction books and I do research and I wanted access to those books. Then we heard that they were scanning our books. They were scanning copyrighted books and they hadn't asked anyone's permission. The libraries had just handed them over. Well, that was obviously a violation of our copyrights and, and a little bit of a surprise to put it mildly. I remember being very curious about what they were doing, and I popped my name into Google and saw that it came up uh, with uh, uh, snippets of my book. So what I did was I searched for terms that I knew were common in the book, like, like star or galaxy. And there were lots and lots of hits, and it would display several snippets, and then uh, I would search for other common words. And it was clear that if you were clever about your searches, you could see quite a bit of the text, if not all of it. Google claimed that its use of, of these millions of copyrighted books that it had digitized was an example of fair use. Why, I'm not sure. I still don't understand how that can be justified. The point is that the entire book has been copied, and it's been copied by a single company that's doing it for purposes of profiting off the work. If you allow a profit-making company to, to, to copy a million books, then how can you say no to the next enterprise that also wants to copy the million books? So the Authors Guild uh, organized a class action suit asking them to stop doing that. When Google made its decision to scan these millions of books, 
it certainly realized that depending upon how litigation developed, um, this could be a bet the company decision because copyright liability in the United States can be quite extreme, $150,000 per copyrighted work. Uh, and depending on the number of copyrighted works at stake, it could be in the billions of dollars. I think the issue of copyright is an archaic, unproductive view. When you create something, you're building on the work of other people, no matter who you are, whether you're J.K. Rowling or Shakespeare. You're, you're basing your work on the work of others. You're basically taking their ideas. Artist does not own their ideas. No artist does. Any useful information is exists because of the efforts of real people. And copyright is our way of remembering who those people are. And uh, it's crucial to not lose that. And I think cyber culture is missing the point of copyright. You might say, well, who cares about authors? Let a few authors not make as much money as they would have. But it's a precedent. The whole internet will become um, a, uh, a tool for the concentration of power, and that would be a disaster. im Jahre 2007 mir auffiel, dass eben eine ganze Menge Bücher von uns dort in der Google Book Search digitalisiert werden, ohne dass wir gefragt worden sind. Und dann stellte sich raus, dass alleine in dem Verlag, in dem ich publiziere, über 200 Bücher, ohne dass irgendeine Erlaubnis eingeholt worden ist von Google, ähm, eingescannt worden sind. Es handelt sich um eine seriöse Firma, die aber gleichzeitig in einer Masse illegale Sachen macht, dass es allein aufgrund der Masse den Anschein hat, als sei es legal. Das Jahr 2007 verstrich, ich schrieb meinen Aufsatz, der sich nicht nur um die rechtlichen Probleme drehte, sondern auch um die Frage, in welcher hundsmiserablen Qualität die Bücher dort eingescannt worden sind. Ja, also, dass sie immer die Hände von irgendwelchen Scannenden noch mit abgebildet haben, dass ein Drittel der Seiten irgendwie kaputt ist, ja, dass sie können faktisch damit gar nichts anfangen im Grunde kann man sagen, sie, sie bauen sozusagen ein filigrane, sie, sie machen ein ganz filigranes Kunstwerk, bei dem es sozusagen auf jede Einzelheit drauf ankommt. Und das, was dann sozusagen in der Google Book Search dabei rauskommt, ist, wie wenn sie dieses Kunstwerk sozusagen durch einen Fleischwolf gedreht hätten. Ja? A book is really a plateau that a person reaches to say, this is my testament, this is what I can offer. A book is not just an extra long tweet. A book is something that's hard to do, it's hard to finish, it's hard to publish. It's a certain achievement of scale. It's a declaration of this is what my life has learned, this is what I can offer. And that is not something that can be dissected and the, the little minced pieces simply can't mean the same thing. The lawsuits were commenced in the fall of 2005. And within six months, the Authors Guild and the publishers came to Google with a, a proposal about settling the lawsuit. It took three years to work it out because there were a lot of issues to be discussed. There were publishers at the table as well as authors, and publishers and authors did not have identical interests. There were libraries not at the table, but very much in the picture. They were talking to Google away from the room. And I'm not sure how much I can say. I definitely cannot talk specifically about the negotiations because I signed a non-disclosure agreement, which I'm told is still in force, and I don't want to go to jail. For those of you who don't know the details of the settlement agreement. It's 385 pages. It has 46 sections of definitions. It's got 15 sections on Google's obligations. It's got nine sections on the economic terms. It's got six sec sec sections on libraries' obligations. So this is not a little three or four page memorandum <laughs> of understanding that we're talking about here. This is a very heavily negotiated agreement. So how many people have not read the 334 pages? Okay. We proposed something 
that was a little bit outside the box, and that was if money is being made, share the money with the rights holders. It couldn't be simpler. So I thought it would be pretty non-controversial. That apparently was naive of me. I personally became increasingly disenchanted with what originally looked like a great idea. They basically transformed the search service into a gigantic commercial enterprise. They really thought they would digitize every book in existence and make it available for a price everywhere. settlement would allow Google to have essentially a license to commercialize all the books that are out of print. There were certainly hundreds of thousands and probably millions of books for whom, even if they were in copyright, no author, no publisher, no rights holder would come forward. And those books are orphans and Google would be able to commercialize those and nobody else would. When I talk to people in the publishing industry, they find it humorous because it's like, well, they're orphaned for a reason. Um, and, and that, in fact, if, if we suddenly found this gold mine where the future of the book are the orphan books, yeah. okay, then boy, those publishers sure aren't very smart. A monopoly was being created, a monopoly of access to knowledge. Did we want the greatest library that would ever exist to be in the hands of one giant corporation which could really charge almost anything it wanted for access to it? Listed below are various potential revenue streams for Google as identified within the settlement. Institutional subscriptions, consumer purchases, advertising uses, public access service, print on demand, custom publishing, PDF downloads, consumer subscription model, summaries, abstracts, compilations of books. That's what you're going to end up with at a minimum. Sure. But what I'm saying to you, Mr. Drummond, does this in fact place Google at such a tremendous advantage in disregard of what has been historically copyright law? How do you respond to those concerns? As of today, we have zero market share in any sort of books. So we're a new entrant to the market. Uh, so far, far from being someone who's controlling the market, we're not even in it yet, and we're trying to get in there. They thought that all we have to do is kind of announce this to the world, and the world will go, God, what a great agreement. And for a while, some people did, but then you started reading the agreement really carefully, and there were lots of questions. The problem was there was nothing in the agreement that respected the privacy of the people who were looking at the books. Google was going to be keeping track of who exactly was reading that book, how long they were reading it, and what they read next. That information could get back to the government could get back to the FBI, could get back to police, could get back to their employer. Because Google wasn't making any kind of guarantees about what they were going to do in respect of this privacy. It was a, a gradual process of getting to know the details of Google Book Search, and it was the cumulative effect of these details that made me feel uh, this project was actually something that I myself could not recommend to the president and fellows of Harvard as something that we should enthusiastically support. If people find that the privacy policies of a particular technology are not to their liking, they should unplug it. They should retreat from the internet. They should cut off their phone lines and they should go up and hide in a mountain. They have that choice. Die Snippets sind nur die Oberfläche. Ja? Die Frage ist, was macht eine Firma mit den von mir hergestellten Daten? Dazu braucht sie gar keine Oberfläche. Verstehen Sie, wenn die meine Texte in ihre Datenbank einführen, sie haben noch nicht mal ein Webinterface, 
das ist auch schon illegal. Verstehen Sie? Weil Sie das zu gewerblichen Zwecken machen und nicht für Ihren Privatgebrauch. H.G. Wells' Idee of the World Brain was a dictatorship of technologists and intellectuals. These are the geeks of their day. And gradually he saw their power would spread from laboratory to laboratory, from university to university. So these people with the expertise began to coalesce into sort of almost like managerial groups that would mean that we don't need the politicians and the conflicts and the noise, confusion, the babble. But for the world brain, there was to be a further component, and this is the component that is, is what disturbs me. It's that how that would be used to achieve the ultimate goals of civilization as it appears to have been evolving towards. After IBM's success with Deep Blue, they looked around for other kinds of games that they could take on. And they wanted something that was a very different kind of game than chess. And so they picked Jeopardy, which is basically a fancy trivia game. It's one of those games that you and I can play. It's a human standing there with their carbon and water versus the computer with all of its silicon and its main memory and its disk. After Germany invaded the Netherlands, this queen, her family, and cabinet fled to London. Maria. Who is Beatrix? No. Watson. Who is Wilhelmina? That is correct. This U.S. president negotiated the Treaty of Portsmouth, ending the Russo-Japanese War. Watson. Who is Theodore Roosevelt? Good for $800. Jim, I did talk to Larry Page when Google first started, because I was really perplexed about why would anybody make a new search engine when we had Alta Vista, which was the current search engine. It seemed good enough. And he said, oh, it's not to make a search engine, it's to make an AI. Most of my discussions have been with Larry Page. We've talked in general about their quest to digitize all knowledge and then develop true AI. I mean, we can create intelligent systems if you have very large databases. And books are actually probably more valuable than all the other stuff on the internet, because we have a high standard for what we put in books. The computer industry and its implications in terms of information technology is a multi-trillion dollar part of the economy. It will be, you know, the basis of everything we do in the future. What Watson showed was you can take a very large, very messy set of data, and if you can use those inputs correctly, you can actually answer really sophisticated questions. And certainly the presence of large amounts of data on the internet is going to be as much an input for machines as it is for people. Not only did Watson have to understand the convoluted language in the Jeopardy query, which includes metaphors and similes and puns and riddles and jokes, but it got its knowledge to respond to the query from actually reading 200 million pages of natural language documents, including all of Wikipedia and several other encyclopedias. An IBM supercomputer named Watson has won the first ever Jeopardy quiz show competition, starring a computer as a player. The Google Book Project is, in a sense, um, trying to make that universal library, um, which could then be read by an AI or a Watson-like um, supercomputer. Google search is going to be assisted intelligence and not artificial intelligence. In my mind, I think of search as this beautiful symphony between the user and the search engine, and we make music together. I've been surprised at the level of controversy there uh, because digitizing the world's books and making them available, there's really, there's nobody else who has attempted it at our scale or who is really working on it. So, um, and, and I feel like we had a number of technical challenges which we've overcome. Uh, there was this legal dispute which, which we have settlement, a settlement proposed uh, at least that we jointly agreed to with the authors and publishers and so forth. But anyway, but it, it remains somewhat controversial. Uh, so, yeah, I'm surprised at the amount of resistance uh, that's had, uh, but ultimately I'm optimistic that we're going to be successful.
das Google Book Settlement hat, wie ich dann eben relativ schnell begriffen habe, Auswirkungen gehabt auf die Rechtssituation in der Bundesrepublik Deutschland. Und das fand ich völlig unstatthaft. Ja, dann dazu ist dann hier gar nicht verhandelt worden. Und daraufhin haben wir eben äh, beschlossen, dass wir zum einen einen öffentlichen Aufruf machen. Das war der Heidelberger Appell. Und wir hatten innerhalb sozusagen zwei, drei Wochen so gut wie alle wichtigen Autoren, also später ist Hertha Müller dann mit dem Nobelpreis äh, geehrt worden, die trat da auf, es tat, äh, Herr Grass hat dort unterschrieben und dadurch bekam das Ganze sowas wie ein Schneeballeffekt. Egal ob dicker Wälzer oder dünnes Büchlein, immer öfter gibt es die Lieblingslektüre in voller Länge auch im Internet zu lesen. Bei Google zum Beispiel sind schon jetzt mehr als 10 Millionen Titel eingestellt und es sollen noch mehr werden. Das aber stört viele europäische Autoren gewaltig. Das Ziel war, die deutsche Regierung dahin zu bringen, dass sie sich politisch auf irgendeine Art und Weise dazu verhält. Für die Bundesregierung ist klar, das Urheberrecht muss auch im Internet seinen Platz finden. Deshalb lehnen wir es ab, dass ohne jeden urheberrechtlichen Schutz die Bücher einfach eingescannt werden, wie dies von Google gemacht wird. Die Bundesregierung wird hier viel Wert darauf legen, ihre urheberrechtlichen Positionen deutlich zu machen und damit den Autoren aus Deutschland auch einen Schutz zu gewähren. C'est comme dans la brousse, vous savez, le feu qui s'est mis à prendre. Le feu a pris, le meilleur des feux, et a commencé à courir. Et je dois dire que j'ai été pour cela aidé par le président de la République. Il n'est pas question de nous laisser déposséder de notre patrimoine au bénéfice d'un grand opérateur, aussi sympathique soit-il, aussi important soit-il, aussi américain soit-il. The first time I realized Google scanned my book was 2009, November. Actually, um, it my, was my lawyer called me and he said, do you know your book be scanned by Google Book? Search engine Google came under intense fire from Chinese authors as is a digital library used books written by Chinese authors or without permission. The reader, they can search my book by the keyword and it made maybe 100, around 100 keyword. But I remember the most ridiculous keyword of my book is the bed, B-E-D, and telephone. That's two words I remember and made me laugh. So this is not intellectual at all. Me and my lawyer decide to sue Google. Before the court is the plaintiff's motion to approve the settlement as fair and reasonable. Numerous materials have been submitted. Did anyone count up the number of objections? We have in the range of 500. Thank you. I flew to New York and it was very exciting. There were 25 outside parties that made presentations to Judge Chin. The proposed settlement results in a de facto monopoly on information and an intensification of media concentration on Google. There was a risk of monopolization there that the Department of Justice saw. The proposed settlement would establish a marketplace in which only one competitor would have authority to use a vast array of works. The risk was that Google could basically hold the whole world hostage to the price of access to these books. And because no one else would have a license, no one else would have a corpus like the corpus they had, we'd have to pay whatever they wanted to charge. The core concerns seem to be that this would diminish the availability to read books in private. That is not true. This service would be available at public libraries. You can walk into your neighborhood library. You can sit down at a free access terminal, anonymously. You can search for and read a book. And if you want to look at it at home, then what? Well, if you want to look at it at home, that may present an issue. 
Here's the rub. This is a tension between requirements for security that are insisted on in order not to have these works be sort of freely disseminated. This is a fascinating turning point, actually, in the whole history of knowledge and of access to knowledge. And it was being played out in a New York courtroom. There's a real risk that should the court approve the settlement, members of the World Trade Organization will initiate settlement proceedings against the U.S. government. And if the U.S. government were to lose such proceedings, which is a very real possibility, our partners would be entitled to impose trade sanctions against the United States. You don't use words like that very often. It wasn't kind of like, oh, gee, there are these issues and we're concerned about something. It was like, this violates a treaty. How can the judge do something that's going to violate a treaty? This is crazy. I am not going to rule today. There's just too much to digest. I will reserve decision. There's much to think about. All rise. And then Judge Chin thought about it. He thought about it, and he thought about it. He took a very long time, and every morning I got up and I thought, what, what is, is Judge Chin going to announce his decision today? And when he finally did, I myself felt thrilled because the court actually refused to sanction the settlement. Then Google Book Search could not take place, at least according to Google's original business plan. U.S. Circuit Judge Denny Chin said the creation of the Universal Library would benefit many but would simply go too far. Chin said the settlement of a class action lawsuit that the company reached with U.S. authors and publishers would grant Google significant rights to exploit entire books without permission of copyright owners. Ja, das ist eigentlich genau das, was ich mir vorgestellt habe. Also war ich so, dass ich überrascht war oder so. Ich ja, natürlich freut man sich, wenn das dann so kommt, ja. Aber ich, ich kann jetzt auch sagen, dass ich irgendwelche ähm, äh, Sektgläser oder so aufgemacht habe. Ja. Ich ne kenne nicht den Juge Chin, aber ich salue in seinem Schwein eine Preuve de, de remarkable Independenz der Justice Amerikaner. Puisque, contre toute la formidable Puissance financière de Google, il a affirmé tranquillement, que les accords passés par cette Firma de Mountain View I think you, you, you could read the, the decision by Judge Chen as a defeat of the screen by the book. But um, this is a long war. This is, this, this is one battle. And, and um, whatever, whatever triumph there might have been for books is going to be short-lived because the screen will ultimately triumph. I think that we owe a great deal to Google. Um, I can't imagine that this digital public library of America would ever have gotten off the ground had Google not started to race ahead with its own version of digitization on this massive scale. However, you know, Google, wonderful as it is, is not familiar with the books. For example, Walt Whitman's famous book of poems, Leaves of Grass, was catalogued under gardening. AI is just a religion, it doesn't matter. What's really happening is real-world examples from real people who entered their answers, their trivia, their experiences into some online database is actually just a giant puppet theater repackaging inputs from real people who are forgotten, we're pretending they aren't there. This is something I really want people to see, that this, the insane structure of modern finance is exactly the same as the insane structure of modern culture on the internet. They're precisely the same. It's an attempt to gather all the information into a high castle, optimize the world, and pretend that all the people the information came from don't deserve anything. Da kann man nicht damit argumentieren, dass die Allgemeinheit beglückt wird. Wenn ich jetzt auf die Deutsche Bank gehe, das Geld raushole und auf der Straße verteile, ja, und sage, dann hole ich so und so viel Arbeitslose von der Straße runter, ja, und die ganzen Bettler, die gibt es dann gar nicht mehr. Es bleibt einfach ein Banküberfall. 
Verstehen Sie? H.G. Wells' view of science and technology was what sustained him and sustained his ideas throughout his whole life. He had this sense that if only we could get the scientists and the technologists working in the right way, we could transform the world. And he, he, he continued with that belief up until the absolute final disillusionment with the entire human world, with a book which he calls so fittingly, Mind at the End of Its Tether. He felt that the whole evolutionary process that he had been studying and that what he felt was leading us to something new and wonderful had failed. And his last words were, There is no way out, or round, or through.